Whether you create your electronic sounds via a traditional keyboard synth, a modular rig, or through a DAW, one component that's pretty much ubiquitous is the oscillator. It's what generates the basic waveforms that we start from when we're constructing sound. But why is it that all of these sound different? I mean, we can speed them up or slow them down to change their pitch, or we can use an envelope to sculpt the volume contours of a particular note, but that's just imposed from the outside. What is it specifically about voltage repeating these simple shapes that makes for a different quality of sound? So that's what I want to talk about in this video, and it reflects how I'm growing and how I think about sound creation. Through this video, I'm going to be using my modular synthesizer setup. There's nothing about what I'm doing here that requires modular, though it is cool, and it does make it easier to run the sort of experiments I'm going to go through. One module that's going to be front and center for this video, and in most of my videos, is the Mordax data. It's really hard to overstate how key that the data has become in my exploration of sound. Eventually, I even had to get a second, and that's going to come in handy in this video because I'm going to want to show you two things at once a lot. So I'm going to start with a brief overview of the basic waveforms that most oscillators produce. If you spend any time with a synth at all, this will be pretty familiar. But I know that there's a lot of people watching who are new to synthesis or are just thinking about jumping in, and I want to set the stage for it. Then I'm going to get into the topic of harmonics and how sounds get built up. From there, I'm going to digress just a bit to talk about what that series of harmonics is and how it leads to additive synthesis. Then armed with that information, we'll look at ways that harmonic content can evolve over time, and we'll wrap up with the patch demonstration. Through this video, I'm going to talk primarily about oscillators that produce pretty standard analog-style waveforms. I'm not going to talk much about more complex VCOs that create crazy washes of sound or wavetable synthesis or anything like that. The techniques I'm going to talk about here are equally applicable to exploring them, but I'm wanting to stick to the basics right now, and apparently I have plenty to choose from. But I'm going to mostly use this one, the Captain Big O. It's a joint project between Create Audio and Pittsburgh Modular. It's a fully analog VCO with a bunch of bells and whistles, some of which we're going to see later. So let's start with a sine wave. It's called a sine wave because it actually does follow the shape of a sine function that you may have learned about in trigonometry class, where you were probably taught that it's all about triangles, which is a shame because it's really all about circles, but that's not important, just cool. The main takeaway is that the sine function is just part of nature. It crops up all over the place. But it's also pretty boring. I mean, listen to it. I've got the oscillator turned to 110 hertz. That's an A. And there really isn't much going on there. Heck, it's even kind of quiet. I probably should have turned up the volume, but I want to compare it with what's coming up. Watch the amplitude of the wave, how high up it rises on the display. It's going between plus 6 and minus 6 volts. Now, compare that to the triangle wave. You can see that they're the same amplitude, plus 6 to minus 6, the voltage just is the same between the two, but the triangle comes across as louder and a little buzzy. And now the sawtooth. It's louder still, but still in the range of plus 6 to minus 6 volts, and it's starting to get a bit of harshness to its tone. Finally, the square wave. And this one I actually had to change the scale on. It actually goes up and down between plus 10 and minus 10 volts. It's actually pretty typical of an analog oscillator for the square wave to have the larger amplitude, but that aside, does it sound slightly higher pitched to you? It does to me, but you can see that the tuner is still right at 110 hertz. Okay, that's enough of that for now. Raw waveforms aren't really the best listening experience, but it's good to think about how they sound different. But why do they sound that way? What's going on? Let's come back to that sine wave again. This time I've pulled up the spectrum analyzer on the Mordax, and what it shows me is how much of each frequency is in the sound that it's being fed. And you can see there's one peak down there by 100 hertz. That's our 110 hertz sine wave being sent from the oscillator. You can see that as I dial the pitch up, you can see the change in frequency, both on the oscilloscope and on the spectrum analyzer. Now let's look at the square wave. Check out all the smaller peaks. We can see them there at 330 Hz, 550, 770, 990. And if we turn up the frequency, we can see that those peaks move, but they always stay an equal distance apart. What's the deal with that? Well, it turns out that most sounds aren't made up of one pure tone at one exact frequency. Instead, we have harmonics, or overtones, which are a whole number multiple of the base or fundamental frequency. 
So in the example with A at 110 hertz, we call 110 hertz the fundamental frequency and also the first harmonic. And then the second harmonic is 220 hertz, the third is 330, the fourth is 440, and so on. It's interesting that with the lower harmonics, they all have a musical relationship to the fundamental with octaves, thirds, fifths. That's not really a surprise since those relationships are all based on the ratio of integers, but it is really interesting, and I'll have to take a look at that another time. If we start at an octave further up, at 220 hertz, what do the harmonics look like then? Well, it's just the integer multiples of 220 instead of 110. So it goes 220, 440, 660, 880, and so on. What's interesting here is that the harmonics all have the same relationship to the fundamental regardless of the frequency. The second harmonic is always double the first, so it's always up one octave. The third harmonic is an octave and a fifth higher. The fourth is two octaves higher, etc. But wait, let's go take a look at those harmonics for 110 hertz again. Didn't I say that for the square wave there were peaks at 330, 550, and 770? What happened to the rest of them? Not every sound uses every harmonic at the same level, or at all. Square waves are made up of only the odd harmonics, so we don't see any of the others. And for the harmonics we do use, the amplitude drops off proportional to the harmonic number. So the first harmonic is full volume, the third harmonic is one-third of that, the fifth is one-fifth of the original, the seventh is one-seventh. Let's take a look at the triangle wave again. You have to look for it, but you can see one little peak down here. Triangle waves are also made up of only the odd harmonics, but they drop off way faster. Instead of being proportional to the harmonic number, it's proportional to the square of the harmonic. So harmonic 3 is only one ninth as strong as the first harmonic, and the fifth harmonic is only one twenty-fifth. Sawtooth is interesting, as it's the only one that uses all of the harmonics, odd and even, and they drop off like the square wave, proportional to the harmonic number. So now let's go back and look at the sine wave again. It has no harmonics at all beyond the fundamental. This solves one of our earlier mysteries. Why were the sawtooth and square waves so much louder than the sine wave? Well, all of those extra harmonics are just additional sound energy, and that's what makes a sound loud. The sine wave only has that one frequency to create all of the energy for the sound, so it's quieter. Ultimately, it turns out that sine waves are the basic building blocks for all of these waveforms and every other one. Any periodic waveform can be created by the right set of sine waves at the right amplitudes and phases. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next section. Actually, I guess we haven't really talked about phase. Phase is where the sine wave starts in relationship to the others. Here's an example where the green wave is out of phase from the yellow one by 90 degrees. And then I just had one more thing to say about sine waves. Just an observation, really. I've been guilty in the past of saying that, bells and whistles aside, most oscillators are all the same. After all, a sine wave is just a sine wave, right? And I thought that right up to the point of making this video. I started out wanting to use this oscillator, the nonlinear circuit CEM3340. It's based around the CEM3340 chip, which was used in a lot of famous analog synths from the 70s and 80s, including the Prophet 5, the Oberheim OB8, Jupiter 6, and even the Memory Moog. It's really full-featured, and Nonlinear Circuits has done a great job of breaking out all the different functionalities built into the chip. It has options I've never seen on another oscillator. But one thing it doesn't have is a sine wave output. So they needed to add a bit of circuitry that probably turns the triangle wave into a sine. I don't know if it's by design or the fact that I'm not the world's best builder, but something about it makes the sine wave a little hinky. You can see it here in blue, compared to the sine wave coming out of the Captain Big O. Especially when the waveforms cross each other, you can see the blue one isn't shaped quite the same. Okay, so far I've shown waveforms on the Mordax and looked at the frequency spectrum, and then I made what might be a surprising statement, that any periodic waveform, which means that it has pitch defined by how often it repeats, can be created just knowing the right harmonics and how strong they should be and in what phase. That discovery is down to this guy, Joseph Fourier. He was a pretty busy guy, what with promoting the French Revolution and accompanying Napoleon to Egypt as a scientific advisor, and he was doing a lot of research into the propagation of heat, including discovering the idea of the greenhouse effect. It was during that work that he discovered that a series of harmonics could recreate functions, even those that were discontinuous, that have sudden jumps in them like a square wave does. This basic idea turned into what we call Fourier analysis, and that says that any signal can be broken down into a series of sine waves. That's part of how MP3s work, by identifying the underlying sine waves that make up a song and using that information instead of every data point. So you can thank Joseph for that.
And if you reverse the process, take all the sine waves and build up a signal from them, that's Fourier synthesis, or we're more likely to know it as additive synthesis. Now, I have to admit that I've never worked directly with additive synthesis. There weren't too many hardware synths based around it, and I don't spend much time in DAWs, so I don't really have too much to say about the practical nuts and bolts of navigating your favorite additive tools. Anyway, despite all that, I did think it would be interesting to spend a bit of time proving the assertion I just made. So I'm going to put it to the test with a bit of software that I wrote, and it's going to try to recreate the standard waveforms that we've been talking about so far. Let's start with the triangle wave, since it's really close to the sine wave, and... Dang, it only took a couple of harmonics to get it dialed in as a triangle wave. I only had to go out to the seventh harmonic, which, since I'm only dealing with odd harmonics, just means four sine waves. And yeah, that looks like a triangle wave to me. That was anticlimactic. It's not too surprising given that the sine was pretty similar to start with, but still. I thought I'd give this a try in Eurorack. So I have a module here that can output four sine waves, the Humble Audio Quad Operator. It's really meant for FM purposes, but it can also output each oscillator independently at an amplitude controlled by CV. So I have the monom teletype generating as precise a voltage as possible, with a different level going into the gain for each operator on the module. Then I'm using maths as a four-channel unity mixer, or at least as close as I can get. And then I've got the output over here on the Mordax. It's triangle-ish? Well, at least it wiggles its way through a triangle shape. I'm not sure what's happening exactly here, but I'm figuring that it has something to do with not getting the exact right small voltage values, and maths not being intended as a unity mixer. Also channels 1 and 4, though I have the rise and fall times turned all the way down, the slew limiters on those channels could be keeping the sine waves from being perfectly formed. Alright, yeah, it's a bit silly to go to all this trouble, but modular is, if nothing else, an exercise in problem solving, so had to do it. Alright, back to the software, something more difficult, a square wave. And again, it takes just a few sine waves to get us into the right area and show us that we're on the right track. Sure, it's pretty wiggly, but the general shape is right. And by the time we're out at the 21st harmonic, it's pretty distinctive. We're using 11 sine waves at this point. It takes us out to something like the 31st harmonic for it to look just like a square wave, and we can keep on layering one on top of another, increasingly tiny changes, and it does look more and more like a square wave. Given an infinite number of harmonics, it would be perfect. But for our purposes, something like 31 is probably close enough. And remember, we only use the odd harmonics for this, so that's only about 16 sine waves. And now the sawtooth wave. Remember that it uses both odd and even harmonics, so it takes twice as many sine waves as the square wave example. It takes longer to get looking like itself as well. For quite a while, it looks like each sawtooth wave has sawteeth of its own. Once we get out here, things are looking straighter, and the only real problem is the intensity of things down at the top and bottom of each wave. It's going to take us out to the 200s to clear that up, but it does eventually. But now we're adding 200 plus sine waves together. Okay, and one last one. I just wanted to try an experiment to see what a waveform would look like if it was constructed just out of the prime numbered harmonics. And let's take a look. I honestly thought it was going to be cooler than that. I should probably figure out how to turn this into a wave file so I can hear what it sounds like. So far I've really just talked about stable, unchanging waveforms. And those are great, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of a single sawtooth wave but most oscillators have at least one option that can change over time, a pulse wave. Like a square wave, it alternates between low and high states, but by adjusting the pulse width, you change the duty cycle, the portion of time that the wave stays high compared to low. The sound of it sweeping back and forth is probably pretty familiar, and now we know that this reflects a change in the harmonics being generated by the waveform. First it brings in some of the even harmonics that we don't even see with a square wave, and then in some cases the dominant frequency shifts, the second harmonic is adding more to the sound now than the fundamental is. Patching an LFO or other slow modulator into the pulse width will give us a constantly shifting set of harmonics that we can let a filter chew on. And then we can modulate the filter cutoff at a different rate to start to add further movement to the sound. If you like making drones, that's a great place to start. Stick around to the end, we're going to see some. There are other options available to us to change the nature of the waveform in time. Wave folding is a good one. The Captain Big O is pretty cool in that it has its own wave folder built in, already normal to the sine wave. Even in its minimum setting, you can see that the sine wave has already changed from what the sine output showed us before. And as we dial up the folding, we see all sorts of harmonics popping in and out, taking turns being the dominant component of the sound.
Another option on some oscillators is continuously variable waveforms. The Make Noise STO, for instance, has this shape control. It starts with a sine wave, and then as you turn it up, it does some crazy things while the harmonics shift around. All right, I guess it's time to wrap things up. I found that the ability to think about sound in terms of its harmonic content and what I can do to manipulate that has really changed how I approach some patches. The background music bed for this video, for instance, is something I just described. It's just one oscillator, the Captain Big O. I've taken the wave folded output and the pulse output and mixed them together. The oscillator is fixed at 55 hertz, but I run that into a high pass filter to remove the fundamental frequency, leaving just the harmonics. Then I run it into the Three Sisters filter, which has three filters that move around together via the cutoff frequency, or space in and out, based on the span control. Then I modulated things like wave folding, and pulse width modulation, and cutoff, and the uh, span control. And you can see on the oscilloscope just how much the harmonics shift around over time. Concentrating on the harmonics and how they evolve has given me a new set of tools that I never had before. I have said plenty of times in the past, including in this video, that modular is an exercise in problem solving, and more tools is always better. Anyway, that wraps up this video. I hope you found it interesting, and if you made it all the way to this point, why not subscribe? Thanks.